Hello, everybody. Welcome to yet another interesting and exciting episode of Law Talks with Tokes. I am your host, Tokes Hussain, and I'm wishing you a truly happy and safe 2021. We've got a great show for you today. Now, my guest is Nani Janssen Revenberg. Who is she? Great question. So glad you asked. Nani is a human rights lawyer that specializes in strategic litigation and freedom of expression. Nani is the founding director of the Digital Freedom Fund, which supports partners in Europe in advancement of digital rights through strategic litigation. Nani is a lecturer in law at Columbia Law School and adjunct professor at Oxford University's Blavatnik School of Government. She is also an associate tenant at Doughty Street Chambers, a senior fellow at Columbia Law School's Human Rights Institute and an affiliate at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University, where she was in fact a 2016 to 2017 fellow. Nane has been an advisor to Harvard Cyber Law Clinic since 2016. Today, we're going to talk about digital rights, freedom of expression, among other things. And just because I like you so much, there's even a special surprise, the good kind. Stay tuned, everybody. Nani Janssen Revenlo, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. I've been a huge fan of your work for quite some time. So thank you for being here. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much indeed. So uh, Nani, you've had a very interesting career thus far, and I wonder if you could take us to the very start. What was growing up uh, like for you, and why did you decide to be a lawyer? I grew up in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, and I ended up studying law, actually because I was a little bit lost as to what I wanted to do <laughs> uh, when I grew up. I couldn't quite uh, figure that out. Um, when I graduated from high school, I originally studied to be a dentist. Um, I wanted to become a flying doctor. I wanted to go to um, developing countries and operate people who had cleft palates and, you know, which is a wonderful, simple surgery, which you can give people a much better life. Um, but it turned out actually in the second year of dentistry school that it wasn't for me. I really didn't like treating patients. Um, so that was kind of an obstacle in actually completing the studies and, and, and uh, making it to be an oral surgeon. So I took a little time out, I worked for about a year and then felt that I really wanted to go back to university but couldn't quite figure out what it was that I wanted to do afterwards. So I decided to focus on something I would enjoy for the duration of my studies and would still give me opportunities afterwards to, to choose something in particular. So I was like, okay, I can study a language, I can study economics, which really I wouldn't have been able to do because I'm terrible at math and uh, then ended up with maybe law. And yeah. um, it's kind of a joke in the Netherlands that law school uh, and economics are kind of the two um, you know, directions that people take who don't really know <laughs> what they want with their lives. And here I was doing exactly that. Yeah. Um, but it turned out that I really loved it. Uh, so for my first kind of like class, I, I, I really enjoyed it. And um, yeah, I have never ever regretted uh, making that choice. It's quite interesting you mentioned dentistry because that was actually one of the things I considered when I was much uh, younger. Of course, I didn't actually go to dentistry school <laughs> like you did, uh, but, but it's good to hear that you've made the right decision. So if you hadn't chosen the career path that you're on at the moment, uh, what do you think that you would be doing today? If I hadn't decided to study law, I probably would have studied a language. Um, I'm guessing I probably would have picked Italian at the time because I was very enamored with uh, Italian culture, literature, opera and obviously also the food um so i probably would have done <laughs> would have done that and i i'm not sure what that would have led to maybe um uh, maybe i would have become a translator or something or an interpreter or um i don't know maybe i would have written really interesting books which i am not doing at the moment so hmm. but uh <laughs> that's my best guess okay so Italian. Okay, that's fair enough. I mean, I'm a big fan of Sicily myself. I haven't actually been to Italy just yet, but, uh, you know, I look forward to it one day. 
So I have tips for you to go. <laughs> okay, great. I, I'll take tips from you at any time. So um, you specialize in strategic litigation, and of course, sometimes this is called uh, impact litigation. I, I understand that it involves using the law, using cases as really a way to provoke uh, social change or societal change. And I know that there's a rich tradition of strategic litigation in America, particularly in the civil rights movement. Uh, Nani, could you just tell us a little bit more about strategic litigation and how it's been used in Europe? Yeah, you gave a really good summary of what strategic litigation is. Um, the way that I sometimes like to describe it, it's like it can be a very powerful tool in the toolbox for social change. Mm -hmm. um, the idea of strategic litigation is indeed that you use the law to bring about bringer systemic changes. Um, but it also means that you are connecting litigation efforts with uh, other means of bringing about change. So good advocacy work, uh, good uh, policy work, lobbying, bringing about a, a public debate about an issue that, that should matter to all of us in society. And that way you also kind of like create a good landscape to really make sure that the case has the effect that you, you are pursuing. Um, and indeed, it's very, it's very often connected with uh, a lot of famous cases in the United States, uh, which is not to say that we haven't had any strategic litigation in Europe. Um, there are many good traditions in, in, in many jurisdictions of really using litigations in the context of social movements. But the term has only kind of, you know, pretty recently taken hold uh, to kind of like really identify that type of work. Um, the work that we support uh, with the Digital Freedom Fund uh, connects to our human rights in the digital context. Um, and uh, there were examples already of that type of work before the Digital Freedom Fund was founded. I think a case that's pretty famous with uh, a lot of uh, people throughout Europe is, is, is the Schrems versus Facebook uh, case in which uh, a, a law student from Austria at the time, uh, basically challenged the way that uh, Facebook was handling private data. Mm -hmm. uh, and there, there are other similar cases like that, that are examples of cases that have had a, a bigger systemic impact. Okay. So I suppose it's, uh, it's right going forward to also uh, give some credit to, to Europe in terms of the, you know, the strides it's made in strategic litigation. So I, I think you, you've provided a very useful understanding of what strategic litigation is when it works properly. But what happens if uh, in a strategic case one suffers a defeat? Can you in fact use a defeat and turn it around to an advantage? Is this something which is possible or something you've done in your career perhaps? Uh, I can't say that I've personally done that, but it is possible. And um, a lot of that has to do with how well you connect the litigation effort to those other efforts. Um, so the idea is basically that if you make sure that there, that you raise public awareness about the issue that you're trying to change, um, you could create such public outrage if you lose the case, if the court doesn't find in your favor, that for example, people will turn to the legislature to push for the type of change that you were looking for. Um, and that has happened uh, in, in, a, in a number of cases, uh, also throughout Europe, but also um, in Asia, in, uh, in Latin America, etc. And that is basically also what you have to prepare for. Once you start planning your case, you have to plan for success. So you have to know what you want to do when you win, what is your implementation plan, but you also have to kind of plan for mitigation strategies and how can you leverage your loss into a win in the end. So when you say you, you have to work with, for example, a lobbyist, is it a case that um, you receive your brief uh, and you identify this is going to be a, a hugely important case in terms of society? And then you, what, you ring up a journalist and say, hey, work with me on this or work, <laughs> or call an NGO. Uh, how does it actually work in practice? No, uh, cases can come about in, in, in many different ways, right? Um, I mean, it's really interesting that you mentioned journalists because uh, the link between investigative journalists and uh, civil society and strategic litigation is one that has proven to be very effective, but it's not one that's being very systematically used at the moment. Um, but it can very often be the case that investigative journalists uncover facts, information, etc., that can later on also be used uh, in, in a litigation campaign. Um, it can be that someone has uh, suffered a particular wrong, um, finds a lawyer or an NGO to, to represent them, 
and they kind of assemble a team subsequently. It can also be that there's a group of people who are already kind of like mapping an issue and have uh, kind of like identified a problem basically that they want to address and that they start monitoring for potential cases that could be brought to help kind of like bolster a campaign for change. So there's many different ways in which that could happen. But the thing that is very important is indeed that um, the people who are involved in the case from different disciplinary backgrounds uh, work together as a team. And also very much that um, the interests of the person whose human rights have been violated or the group whose human rights have been violated are centered in the casework. Okay. So teamwork makes the dream work in, in essence. <laughs> uh, but what I wonder though, say you gain a victory, the, the judgment is in your favor. Are there any enforcement problems which might actually hinder the societal change being sought to begin with? It depends a little bit on what you've asked the judge to be straightforward. Uh, you can ask for a finding that, for example, a piece of legislation should be struck down, uh, in which case the, the legislator has to go back to the drawing board. And there you have a risk that the legislator might not actually come with a better piece of legislation, but one that's cosmetically changed, but essentially could be even worse. So again, here it's an important factor that you've garnered kind of like public support and that you've raised awareness so that when this legislative process is, in, is going on, people yeah. can actually intervene and, and, and push for the outcome that they, that they want. Um, sometimes it's up to particular government agencies uh, to follow up, uh, to change their policies, et cetera. And this can be something that sometimes takes a while. Also the legislative change can take a while, uh, but it comes down to sustained pressure and kind of like keep on bringing up the issue and flagging that change is still you know, forthcoming and uh, that they have to get on with things basically. Now, I, I want us to talk about uh, some notable cases you've been involved in. And for this, I'd like you to imagine that your life is a Netflix series. And I want to talk about the episode wherein you were counsel in the Konate and Burkina Faso case. And of course, that case is the first freedom of expression judgment in the African Court of Human Rights and uh, people's freedom, uh, people's uh, rights, I should say. So tell me, what was this case actually about and, and why is it important? The case concerned uh, an editor and a journalist in Burkina Faso, Mr. Konate, uh, who published a number of articles that were critical of a local public prosecutor. In essence, he... Uh, alleged that he had been corrupt and uh, he was prosecuted for having published those things. Like the, the, sorry, the public prosecutor filed a complaint and subsequently uh, criminal charges were, were pressed against uh, Mr. Konate. Yeah. Um, in the end, uh, he was uh, convicted to a year imprisonment and payment of uh, fines and penalties that amounted to about 18 times the average uh, annual salary in Burkina Faso. Uh, he appealed. Uh, and unfortunately also lost on appeal. At the time, uh, I was uh, working at uh, an NGO, NGO called the Media Legal Defense Initiative, uh, which has now been rebranded as uh, Media Defense, uh, which is based in London and defense journalists and bloggers worldwide. Yeah. And um, we basically got in touch with Mr. Konate's lawyer asking if we could support the case. Yeah. So we provided financial support. But then when uh, his conviction was upheld uh, on appeal, the lawyer wasn't very interested in taking matters further. But Burkina Faso was, uh, is a country that uh, allows access to both the ECOWAS Community Court of Justice and to the African Court on Human and People's Rights. So we basically found someone who could visit Mr. Konate in prison and uh, ask if he wanted to be represented by this woman in London that worked for this NGO and wanted to take his case to, uh, to, uh, to an international court. Uh, and he wrote a little authorization on a, on a paper note, uh, which we took and then uh, decided to file at the African Court on Human and People's Rights. Awesome. So how would you describe the, the impact it's had on the, uh, the continent? Uh, if you were to give it a ranking from zero to 10, zero is eh, shouldn't have bothered. <laughs> And 10 is extremely important. Uh, it, ooh, do I actually have to give it a number? <laughs> uh, that's really oh. interesting to kind of like rank your own work. I would say that it's extremely important. Yes. And okay. there is still work to be done. Um, okay. So uh, it sets an important precedent in the sense that it um, that is kind of like affirmed that there are limitations, right, to the penalties that can be imposed under criminal defamation laws. 
says that uh, they have to be proportionate, that um, imprisonment is never an acceptable punishment. And it has led to subsequent national cases uh, in which legislation has been struck down that was overly punitive. However, there are still many countries uh, on the continent that still have these types of laws on the books. Um, so there's still scope for follow-up litigation uh, in order for it to have its kind of maximum impact. Sure. I, I wonder though, do you think that uh, defamation should be criminal to begin with? Or shouldn't this no. be a civil? No. <laughs> no, um, there's actually, what was really nice, uh, well, we tried actually to get the court to say that criminal defamation just shouldn't exist. Um, unfortunately, they didn't go for that, but four of the 10 judges uh, had a dissenting uh, view on that. Mm -hmm. And I very much agree with uh, the way that they put it actually, which is like for, for all these um, egregious examples that you get as, to like, ju as justification for having criminal defamation on the books, yeah. you can actually have other types of legislation. You don't need criminal defamation. You can deal with those issues under civil law. Uh, and for those things, you know, situations in which speech should actually be criminalized, that doesn't fall within the defamation bracket. Okay. Well, we're still on the uh, NAMI Netflix series, and this episode <laughs> is, is the case of, I, I may say this wrongly, uh, and please correct me, it's my Silova and Azerbaijan, which was an ECHR case that concerned the arbitrary detention of a journalist. And this matter is of personal and professional interest to me, as I've advocated for journalists myself in similar positions. So I suppose the first question is, how is the case name actually pronounced? And secondly, what were the legal issues involved in this case? Uh, Khadija Ismailova, uh, uh, an award-winning Azerbaijani uh, journalist, um, very much disliked by the president and his family because she always, always <laughs> managed to uh, um, yeah, get on their case, if I can put it that way. Uh, she has uh, had several cases and she still has several cases pending before the European Court of Human Rights. Um, I was involved in, in two of them. Uh, one that basically uh, concerned uh, her pretrial detention uh, after she had originally been accused of having incited suicide, uh, which was a charge that later on was, was, was dropped uh, and instead she was basically uh, accused of having committed fraud. Um, and uh, another case concerned uh, an egregious violation of her privacy um, in the sense that uh, secret cameras had been placed in her house and uh, she had been filmed uh, uh, in intimate moments uh, with, with, with her partner and those were placed online, which uh, is terrible enough as it is, but uh, especially if you think about the fact that uh, Azerbaijan is a very conservative society, uh, you know, uh, having a romantic relationship out of wedlock and then, you know, having images like that uh, being posted online is, is, is particularly harmful. Of course. I wonder if you have any advice for journalists who may find themselves in similar predicament. For, from, a, from a lawyer's perspective, uh, it would of course be very prudent to kind of like make sure that uh, your work is, is almost bulletproof, right? Um, in the sense that you can really justify what you've written, um, that uh, you try to refrain as much as possible from uh, framing anything in a way that could be considered as any kind of like spurious claims or, or, or allegations. So, uh, but, you know, any proper journalist <laughs> would do that. Um, however, there's, of course, uh, choices that you make and that your editor helps you make, right, uh, in, in the way that you frame things uh, in your publications. Um, this all, not to say that that will mean that you can avoid <laughs> getting sued or, or getting prosecuted, but at least you'd be in a good position uh, to defend your case and, if necessary, take it to a higher level. Um, and then there's the other bit, and that's like really carefully considering, you know, uh, your security, your your physical security, but also, of course, your digital security, because uh, journalists, um, just as uh, human rights defenders, quite often are, are quite vulnerable to um, being hacked and getting malware, spyware, etc., installed uh, on their devices, uh, which would give access to their sources, etc. So um, there's a lot of different things to consider, and. Um, to, to kind of like come back to uh, uh, Ms. Ismailova, uh, she currently kind of like is, is, uh, is basically trapped in Azerbaijan. She cannot leave the country because there's a, t a travel ban imposed on her as well as others, uh, which is a case that's also now before the European Court of Human Rights. 
um, but it also kind of requires a lot of personal dedication and energy, right? To kind of like be willing to stick so much with with your with your work and and what you believe in, in spite of actually basically constantly being harassed. So. Now, um, you've been the director of uh, the DFF for quite some time, and I know the DFF supports strategic litigation and it wants to advance digital rights in Europe. So um, I, I want to take this on a very basic level. So what are digital rights to begin with? Digital rights are all our human rights, but as engaged uh, in the digital context. So very basic example, right to privacy. Uh, you wouldn't want anyone uh, to open the mail that has been deposited in your mailbox. Likewise, you wouldn't want anyone to read your emails if you haven't given them authorization to do so. And that way, um, you know, any human right can kind of be translated to uh, to the digital context or have implications in, in that realm. Okay, thank you. And what are the major obstacles faced by digital rights defenders that you've encountered in your work as the director of DFF? Um, I guess the, one of the, the main kind of like challenges is the, is the sheer uh, volume of issues. Uh, there is so much going on at the same time. Uh, at the moment. And I think that, uh, you know, since we've all had to move even more of our lives online uh, since the pandemic, I think for a lot of people it's become very, very clear how dependent we've become on uh, technology, uh, on digital means to communicate with each other, to, to work, to, to learn, um, uh, etc. Um, sometimes even access basic services. Um, and uh, there's there's just a lot of <laughs> a lot of lot of issues to to pay attention to at the same time. Uh, and it's a, it's a relatively small field of actors. Um, um, and as always, uh, resources are short, uh, uh, as it is in many different areas of human rights as well. Uh, but I think that basically kind of the, the challenge versus the, the resources that are available is, is, is one of the biggest kind of like systemic things. Okay. Um, we're going to take a short break now. When we come back, we're going to talk about some of the current issues in digital rights and also freedom of expression and uh, look forward to it. Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Tov Sassain, and we have Nami Yantin Revenlo, who is the director of the Digital Freedom Fund. And we've had a very interesting conversation thus far. Now, why don't we talk about some of the current issues in the digital rights sphere and also freedom of expression? And I think that um, we can speak about the leaks. And of course, I'm referring <laughs> to Julian Assange, who is the founder of WikiLeaks. Uh, as you're recently aware, Nani, uh, here in the UK, in the Old Bailey, it was ruled that uh, he couldn't be extradited to America. And the legal basis was that extradition would be harmful to his mental health. So some people, in essence, think that this was the right decision, albeit for the wrong reason, uh, because they saw it as a missed opportunity to address the matters of uh, um, whistle, being a whistleblower, journalism, etc. And I wonder, Nani, do you think that this was, in fact, a missed opportunity? I think I would have to agree with that. I mean, overall, I think um, uh, press freedom advocates are very relieved uh, that no extradition is going to take place anytime soon. Uh, but it would have been really wonderful to have had a strong judgment to basically underline the importance of the type of work that uh, Mr. Assange was engaged in, uh, which is very like um, the work that many investigative journalists do. Um, and just the mere idea that they could be subjected to extradition requests like this that are based on um, basically being accused of, of having hacked uh, into a government system, uh, that's yeah, that can have a potential chilling effect, right, on uh, on journalistic, uh, investigative journalistic work. Um, so I think that overall, it would have been it would have been great if that had been addressed uh, thoroughly in in this judgment. Okay, thanks for your views. Um, another issue is this: so the UK government is planning to change the law so that social media companies like Facebook, Twitter, etc become legally responsible. They, they will have, in essence, a duty of care, um, you know, with regards to the safety of users. So in light of 
these uh, pressing issues such as cyberbullying, mental health, uh, hate speech, should social media companies be responsible for their content in, in your view? Um, yes, there is a responsibility, but it all depends on how that responsibility is, you know, implemented in practice, how that's operationalized. Um, I think that one of the biggest problems that we have at the moment with uh, social media companies regulating content on their platforms is the lack of transparency and also the lack of due process for anyone to actually challenge any decisions to remove content uh, or make it less accessible to, uh, to the audience that they're trying to reach. Um, because like at the moment already there's there is there are community standards right there are terms of service that are seeking to kind of make sure that it's a space in which everyone quote unquote uh, can engage uh, in debate with each other but the way that is being enforced is is not is one not transparent and also uh, there where we have seen uh, here and there some some leaks for example on the way that facebook uh, for example trains its content moderators um, there are some serious issues in the sense that the speech of certain groups um, and uh, the ProPublica uh, publication on this was very interesting in regard that uh, speech of, of, uh, of, of white men was basically uh, more protected than uh, of uh, specific minoritized groups and marginalized groups online. So uh, there is a lot to be done. Um, and the question is actually, um, how far do you also want to go in kind of like interfering with how these companies are going to be implementing an obligation like that? Um, another thing that's important to flag there is that there's a risk of uh, overcautious behavior from these platforms uh, that would kind of like abound to like way too swift takedowns and, uh, and content removals for risk of being penalized for not having followed up to their duty of care. Uh, and you see that uh, type of um, impact with uh, legislation like they've adopted uh, in Germany um, with the Netz DG, which basically makes social media companies responsible for enforcing hate speech legislation. Um, and that's legislation that's been copied already in, in numerous countries around the world. Um, and it basically incentivizes uh, very active censorship. And, and I don't think that that is where we want to go either. Okay. So, so it seems to me at least that quite a few of these social media companies have their own internal guidance as to how they deal with hate speech, community standards, etc. So do I take it that you, you don't subscribe to the notion that there should be a universal a set of guidance and principles that they ought to follow, or should it be left to the individual social media companies to decide how to deal with these matters? It is their platform after all, right? Yeah, no, <laughs> well, the universal guidance that they should follow is the human rights framework. Um, um, but I think a lot of it will, in the end, still hinge on how it's being implemented, how much of an investment are these companies making in operationalizing uh, a commitment to a space in which free flow of information can really take place. Okay, awesome. So um, let's talk now about another hot topic issue, which is that of uh, misinformation or fake news as it's uh, colloquially called. Uh, is there a danger in your mind, Nani, that the legitimate aim of curbing misinformation may hinder free speech? Yes, <laughs> um, and, we've, and, and we see that in practice also, right? Um, in, in many countries, fake news laws are actually used to uh, stifle dissent, uh, silence uh, opposition, silence critical views, particularly silence uh, critical opinions when it comes to uh, government uh, conduct uh, and, and, and policy. Um, and um, while, you know, of course, it's very understandable that, well, it, it particularly came to the fore in the, in the context of the pandemic most recently, you yeah. would want to avoid the spreading of incorrect information about the virus and about uh, and measures that can be taken to, to prevent it, et cetera. Um, just deciding to kind of like adopt legislation that's usually formulated in a rather broad way because try to define what fake news is and under which circumstances something should qualify as fake news it's often very multi-interpretable and, and just lends itself to, to abuse. Um, 
Instead, uh, governments should really think about other ways of making sure that the right information reaches their citizens and reaches uh, the people. For example, by being more proactive in providing clear and transparent information themselves and making sure that uh, they do a, a, a make a proper effort uh, in reaching everyone who needs to be reached. I think that that could be a much more effective way and a, and a much more free speech respecting way uh, than uh, adopting fake news legislation and enforcing it. Okay. Uh, let me ask you about the future of digital rights. But before I ask uh, my main question, I, I'm, I'm actually curious about a project in which the DFF has been involved in, which is about the uh, decolonization the, the of um, digital rights. What does that actually mean to, to the lay person? Uh, so the project uh, tries to change uh, the power structures that are currently uh, holding the digital rights field in place. Um, it stems from observations uh, uh, from not only us at DFF, but also our project partner Edry and, and many in the digital rights field, that when we are having conversations about digital rights in Europe at the moment, the room is rather homogenous in its makeup. Uh, it's uh, mainly... Um, uh, white, male, uh, cisgendered, able-bodied, etc. people that are having these conversations, which means that uh, a really, really large portions of our society are not represented in these conversations. And that basically means that we're working with a watchdog that's not as able as it could be to defend the digital rights of all in this world. And this is something that we would like to change. Um, why we use the term decolonizing instead of, for, for example, diversity, equity, inclusion, or, or, or other terminology that is often used, is because when you use the idea of diversity and inclusion, you're basically talking about bringing people into a framework that needs to change much more from a fundamental, on a much more fundamental basis. Uh, and this is what we're trying to figure out uh, how we can do that. Okay, so it's essentially address some structural changes as opposed to just uh, uh, being on the surface, which, which is a commendable project to begin with, and uh, I wish you success in it. Uh, now, we, we frequently hear about uh, devices being hacked or tech companies that uh, accumulate personal data for ads, etc. And I wonder, though, is the future of digital rights bleak? If not, what do we have to look forward to, Nami? Oh, wow, is the future bleak? Um, I don't think so, not necessarily. Uh, I know there's a lot of doomsday writing out there. I still believe that we can fight back and that we can avoid th those worst uh, case scenarios. I do think that in order to avoid this bleak future, uh, we really have to kind of make sure that there's a much broader understanding with everyone, exactly how like the use of technology and technology being involved in so many aspects of our lives has an impact on our human rights. Uh, and um, that is something that is quite often uh, absent at the moment. Uh, there's still overall kind of a feeling that technology is complicated. It has nothing to do with me. If I swipe left or right on an app, it has, it has no actual impact on my life, but and I'll accept the terms of service, it's all fine. Um, and I think that that kind of like to a large extent is rooted in, in insufficient understanding of uh, the impact that all this data collection and data sharing has. Um, so we, we do have our work cut out for us, uh, but, I, but I still believe that we can do something to make sure that the future is not so bleak. Okay, and so for us digital citizens, I suppose we have a duty to take an active interest in our digital rights as well, don't we? Absolutely. Okay, so we're going to go on a short break now, and we'll be back in due course. This is Tok Sassane, and we have, of course, Nani Janssen Reventlow, who is our guest today. So, uh, Nani, I want you to join me in this fantasy land, and here you're going to, in light of your work defending freedom of expression cases, you're going to represent your client. Your client is uh, Mr. Trump, and you're going to appear before the US Supreme Court. Big shout out, RIP to the RBG. And this concerns social media companies' recent decision to block him on their platforms. So how it's going to work is you will have an initial conference with him, then you're going to address the court 
possible. So, you ready? I am. Okay. Here we go. Mr. Trump, as you know, in light of your recent remarks, uh, your social media accounts have been blocked. What are your thoughts? It's so unfair. So bad, Nanny. I don't believe it. Like the other Donald said, this is America, not China. So, I've been watching the people versus LJ, and I got the perfect defense. Okay? It was a perfect speech where you can't impeach. Fantastic, right? I highly advise you to exercise your right to silence in the courtroom. All rise for the Chief Justices of the United States Supreme Court. Honorable Court, we may all enjoy the silence from my client right now, but we should not be pleased that he has been silenced on social media. Mr. Trump has always been a man of the people. Therefore, he always sought to communicate with the people directly. As most of our lives are unfolding online these days, it makes sense for many of his communications to take place via platforms such as Facebook, Instagram, and of course, Twitter. Leaving aside the suspicious timing of deactivating Mr. Trump's accounts, they set a dangerous precedent. First, because of Mr. Trump's position at the time as a head of state. It is established international law that political speech deserves greater protection. Allowing a, pla a private platform to curtail political speech is a direct threat to democracy. Second, and perhaps most of all, Mr. Trump's ban from social media sets a dangerous precedent for democracy worldwide. Inevitably, those in power in less open society will use what happened with the President of the United States as justification to silence dissenting voices. This could have disastrous results for free speech worldwide. Therefore, it is imperative that this court sets the record straight and find that Mr. Trump's right to freedom of expression has been violated. Thank you. Well done. Go back to life, back to reality, like the song goes. <laughs> Awesome indeed. Uh, I was transported to the US Supreme Court. So uh, thank you very much for your uh, excellent advocacy skills, which I believe we've all learned from. So Nani, I understand you're going to leave DFF at the end of uh, the year. I wonder what's next for you? This is a good question and a big question mark at the moment. Um, right now, I'm mainly focused on ensuring a good leadership transition uh, within the organization so that at the end of the year, um, uh, I can leave and uh, the organization is in good hands and, and on a path forward. Um, I'm thinking also, of course, about what I might want to do next. Um, what I can say right now is that it also has to do with strategic litigation. Um, that it will also kind of have a connection to the decolonizing work um, I've been involved in. Uh, so there will be a focus on uh, racial, social and economic justice. Um, and I'm very happy to tell more uh, when I'm actually able to articulate that <laughs> with a little bit more precision than uh, it's formulated in my head right now. So it's very much a work in progress. Sure. I do have some suggestions though. You could be a dentist in Italy <laughs> who sues for <laughs> strategic litigation. Good, right? Okay. <laughs> I'll put that on the list of things to consider. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, Nani. Uh, so, as I mentioned from the start, you know, you've had a very extraordinary career and still going. Uh, do you have any advice for people who'd like to do what you're doing, people who already do what you do? What advice would you offer to these people? I, I would say uh, be both uh, very persistent and flexible. Um, I always uh, think back of the fact that I had never ever really done anything related to freedom of expression uh, while I was studying human rights law, while I was doing uh, a master's, etc. It just never really occurred to me. Um, but that was the opportunity that was open to me after leaving the law firm uh, that, that I worked, uh, that I trained with uh, for, for my, the first four years after graduating. Um, and I've never regretted it. Uh, and. I think that it's important to kind of like keep in mind that there are many different ways to end up doing what it is that you want to be doing. Well, thank you very much for very excellent advice indeed and for your time today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this has been Nani Janssen Bantlo, who as we know by now is a human rights lawyer that specializes in strategic litigation and is the uh, director 
of Digital Freedom Fund. Nami, thank you very much for your time and I wish you all the success in your future. Do take care. Thank you so much. Likewise. <laughs> Bye.